welcome everybody to uh, book group number nine, which is our, our final book group, because this is uh, we, when we finish this session, we will have covered all the chapters of Play is the Way. And um, it's a pretty great finale, actually, because we've got three of Scotland's most distinguished academics, actually, here, early years academics, to talk about their chapter, Raising the Status of the Early Years Workforce, which is a, a, a cause very dear to Upstart's hearts. So um, I'll introduce them all just quickly, and, and then we're going to, to talk in, in sequence. So I'll just, ladies, let you go from one to the other and I'll just keep out of the way. Um, first of all, we've got Professor Alain Wendy Dunlop, who um, has written so many papers and books and conducted so much research and generally knows everything about early years so that I don't think she will be unfamiliar to anyone who knows about early years in Scotland. Um, secondly, it, Dr. Marion Burns, HMI, who um, it, well, apparently, I, I believe is just retiring, but has been working part-time with Education Scotland and um, is best known to us, I suppose, as one of the co-authors of the wonderful Realising the Ambition. So for that, she gets heroin status with Upstart. And um, oh, final heroine here is Dr. Lynn McNair, who is the um, OBE, head of the Cowgate Nursery, <coughs> sorry, under five centre and a senior teaching fellow in, in Edinburgh, um, recently introducing the, the Fribble Masters in Education. So it, it couldn't be a, a better lineup. And we're going to start with Alan Wendy. Is that okay? Can I ask you to screen share? Good evening, everyone. This is really exciting to be here. Um, can we move very quickly from the title slide, Marion, which gives the title of the book. Um, when Sue asked us to undertake this book group and we're rather late because I wasn't available for a lot of the time this year. But um, as we were thinking about it, I was making some notes and I thought, what really is the question? Um, what about the status of the workforce? Are we visible? And I say we, because I think even um, with the introduction Sue gave, I feel I'm a member of the early years workforce. Um, differently, but nevertheless active and taking part. And it, I put out a provocative question um, to everybody at the time saying um, that I thought really there was a big question about whether we're visible or invisible, heard or not heard, and how we valued, and what would it be like if we weren't? And Although the title of our book is about, about our chapters, Raising the Status of the Early Years Workforce, we actually addressed it through what that meant for children's experience and what it meant for what practitioners might do about that. Um, how do the two link together? But I come back to this notion that are we seen? Are we heard? Are we valued? And I think we need to be all of those things to be effective for children. So we hope we might answer that in the discussion around our chapter and in chatting with you presently. And so we want to look at the nature of children's experiences, people's career pathways, common knowledges that we might share and how those are applied in practice. And Marion will start with what makes an effective educator. If we do this seamlessly, I'll then talk about Effective, effective educators in the power of study, and we'll go on to Lynn uh, on the role of practitioner inquiry. And we come back to me to see if we have actually answered the question and whether we, uh, what the key values are in trying to do so. Thank you, Ali Wendy. So thank you um, everyone for coming along this evening and I know this is a kind of holiday period for many people so delighted that uh, so many of you have come along and thanks to Sue for inviting us. So just as Ali Wendy has mentioned in our chapter we consider three main issues affecting the status of the early years workforce uh, and I want to propose that there are many connected elements um, to consider when trying to answer the question uh, and building in how, what that really means for children's experiences but what is it that makes an effective educator 
Ali Wendy uh, provoked her thinking um, and asking us to go beyond those three um, issues that are in our chapter. And so how do we make um, the workforce visible, heard and valued? Uh, I want to talk a wee bit about who calls that out and, and who decides and on what basis. I wonder if the answer lies in further study. Does it lie within scrutiny? Uh, obviously, that was a, um, something that I would have been interested in. Or is it in greater support through collaboration and a shared passion for our children and families? Really, I guess in these turbulent times, all these questions may appear impossible re to resolve or at best challenging. So let's go back to that question then. What is it that sets the effect of educators apart? And how do we define um, an educator's effectiveness? I suppose to, do, to provide perhaps a response to this, um, I, I want to draw first of all on my work as an HMI and then secondly um, on my transitions research because the, these things link and it is about the impact of, on, on children. But I doubt if we could come up with a short, concise definition of that word effectiveness because after all, your interpretation of what it means to be effective may be different from mine and from others. So is there a balance to be struck? And anyway, what is it we're measuring and judging on when you think about what it is to be effective? From a scrutiny perspective, I think it's about the impact that this educator is having on the child. Is the child benefiting from positive or negative experiences and interactions? And is the quality of that child's play high quality? What about the child? Are they happy? Are they motivated? questioning, curious as a result of the interactions and the spaces that they engage in and or alongside their peers and others? And how well is this educator actually attuned to the needs of the child? So if we take all of those interconnected things, does that make them effective? What impact does that have then on the child? From a research perspective, I ask and I wonder, what does this educator know about play? about early language development as this child transitions through life? Are the pedagogical approaches that are used by the educator suitable? Are they challenging, contextualised? Are they responsive and child-centred? And how familiar are they with educational theory? Current thinking about how children grow and develop and are they using their eff effectively this know-how in their everyday engagement with the child? What about their length of service? Has that got anything to do with being effective? Not very, in my view, because length of service does not equal effective. The one doesn't follow the other. We can have 20 years of, effect, of, of uh, practice, but it doesn't mean that we're effective. We could have somebody with a very short career path, and yet they can have a huge impact on children's experiences. But what about the career path then, and their initial qualifications? Well, if the educator has a string of professional qualifications, would I know this only by observing their practice? Of course, there will be signposts that demonstrate levels of competence, the quality of communication, the interactions, the relationships, the permissions that they give children in their pedagogy. And what about the environment of that's on offer? Or is it in the behavior, behaviors of the child or the children? What about being fleet of foot? Is that what it's all down to? This is what you would find on page 132, those words. What does that actually mean? Is it a bit of being reflective? And is it about how that educator employs their training, how they upskill themselves through study, deepening their professional knowledge? And do they apply it well? So who does call it out in terms of effectiveness? What is it that makes that effective educator visible and for all the right reasons? that they're visible. The ELC sector in Scotland is diverse and it's complex, as are the routes into the workforce. Step inside a playgroup a number of years ago and the workforce they may, there may well have originated from a group of interested parents, mostly mums, I would add, who would have had a wide range of backgrounds and initial qualifications, not uncommon to be unrelated to childcare in early years, and yet they were there. The SSC set out to level out some of these disparities in the ELC workforce, as did the 2015 review led by Iram Siraj. And yet still today, we've not leveled out that playing field. 
the Care Inspectorate and Education Scotland, they come at, that at the effectiveness debate from many different points around the compass. Different quality frameworks evaluating with would be my experience in Education Scotland rather than doing things to people. But let's not get into that arena tonight. The educators focus on self and peer reflection is the, in the face of it a way to promote voice, the educator's voice, the workforce voice to be heard among the clamour for proof of impact, of making a difference, of narrowing the attainment gap, of generating accounts of what I need to do to improve outcomes for children. So I think self and peer reflection does provide a space for the educator to seek out or to challenge the need, the desire, the expectation to engage in further study, to collaborate with others. And lastly, professional inquiry, what to study, which path to follow, which brings me to realising ambition. What has realising ambition done to raise the status of the early years workforce? Well, I believe it's given the early years educators a voice. It's empowered you to be confident about what you know already. I think it's given you permission to adopt child-centred pedagogies, pedagogies of play. It supported the learning of educators and promoted a whole lot of continuing lifelong professional leadership. And I think it's also challenged existing beliefs and assumptions about your role. I think we need to do that. It's encouraged professional learning, but it's also signaled clearly what children need from you and what this means for your pedagogical practice. So yes, I think realising the ambition has recognised the value and the importance of the ELC sector. I wonder if you think the same or perhaps differently. Let me finish before I hand back um, and hand on to Ali Wendy. Here's a quote from Realising Ambition. Effective educators are advocates for children, empowering them to have agency over what and how they learn at a pace which mirrors their curiosity and their thirst for knowledge. Ali Wendy, back to you. Thank you very much, Marion. Um, I'd like to try and provide a little connection there. When Marion talked about feet of foot, I immediately thought, does that, is that what know-how is? And then you talked about know-how. And so I come into this um, in my first slide on what the source of that know-how might be. Um, thank you, Marion. And I, I've put my thoughts down on paper just to guide me as well down on the slide. But I think, of course, initial qualifications play a part. We all start somewhere. But it's what we do once we start that journey from that first stepping point that is really crucial. And I think in that sense, I've come to understand that whatever the first source of our interest and in our qualifications and how we build on that, we all need to be expert about early childhood. And that expertise um, grows with experience. Um, not just with time, as Marion said, but with what we do with that time. So I think Marion provides us in the chapter as well with much to think about around effectiveness and all these different elements of being effective. I think effective educators are people who continue to learn. And I think if we stop learning, then we probably stop being effective because we begin to make assumptions that we know. And that can happen in the moment with a child where you think they're searching for, might be a particular piece of Lego or a particular shape of block and being extra helpful, you hand it to them. And actually you've made an assumption, you've handed something to them that they weren't looking for. And that can change direction, or if they have agency, they can make it quite, quite clear that wasn't what they were searching for. So I think assumptions can happen in the moment, but they can also happen overall in our practice. And I look back on how the joy and happiness of working with young children was a real driver to get involved in attending talks, discussions with colleagues, reading together sometimes, exploring our habitats that we were occupying at the time in our settings. And when we shared together, how we observed, how we paused, how we responded, how we interacted or didn't, 
how we inquired and then provided, not making assumptions. And I think it was those threads that led me to further study. And I, I, I'll talk about that experience because it goes back a long way, I think. Next slide, Marion, please. Um, and in the, in the chapter, we wrote about the power of study. And I think it is really powerful. I think there's a study to do of all the people who come back after some professional practice to start again. And they are absolute stars always. They bring so much with them and they, they share and they learn together. And I think as a tutor, I found what you were doing was giving people a kickstart to learn from each other as much as anything that you might be able to offer them. But what the effect is, is having a discipline to read. It's very hard to have a purpose to read about work-related matters if there isn't a sharing, if there isn't an incentive to do that. And this is why a group like this has been so exciting, that discussing and reflecting together. And I think it helps to understand your own practice differently and to reflect on it, not to think it's wrong. I've had people say to me, but I've been doing such and such all these years. That wasn't right, was it? Well, of course it was right at the time, but it's how you then move on and de develop from it and grow in confidence. And I think being able to articulate that is absolutely crucial, to be able to justify your know-how and feel okay about thinking afresh about things so that you engage with others, that you get that kickstart, that you have the confidence. And I've written at the bottom there, if you stop learning, you've reached the end of the road. So Lord help me, <laughs> I need to keep on learning. So my last slide, please, Marion. Um, and that leads to that, okay, so if we're fleet of foot, if we've got know-how, what do we do with it? And that's crucial in knowing whether we're being effective. And I think it's a self-consciousness about uh, your own contributions and their potential and their impact on others. And when you contribute and when you don't, when you give space for children um, and don't assume. And that really important factor of if we're going to be articulate, it's not just in what we say, it's in what we do. So in what you do, in how you act, is that consistent with what you say about it? Those two things have to be like this, I think. Um, and uh, I do remember somebody coming to visit um, a student we had in, in nursery and she came to see me in the office afterwards and she said, you know what? What was so great about that person's practice was what she had told me about it was what I actually saw her doing. And it's amazing to think there could be a gap, but I think that's why we can be, how we can be effective and never forgetting why we are. That it's for children, they're not our children, for families, their families and for the communities where we share journeys collaboratively. And I think Marion's absolutely right that we've got RTA to help us link all those things together, the words and the actions. Over to Lynn. Thank you. Um, hi, um, and, and hopefully what I'm going to talk about will connect both Marion and Aline Wendy's uh, pre um, presentation to next slide, please, Marion. So I'm going to um, just start with a kind of a bit history in a way. Some years back, Eileen, Wendy and Marion and I um, were in Australia and we, uh, we, we were um, studying on our uh, transition project and it was fabulous. We were having a great time. But Eileen, Wendy, because of all the contacts she has and the, the ability to network all over the world she took us to this nursery that you really had to book to um 
to to get into but because of Arlene Wendy being who she is um we got into this nursery now everybody on this call the majority of people on this call will visit other nurseries and they will um make up their mind about them they will there'll be some parts alike some parts they don't like the bit that really struck me when we came to this nursery, because Eileen Wendy left us kind of open um, and what we would find out. She never told us too much before we got there, but felt that it was important that we got there. And um, we were greeted by the head and the head right away started kind of linking theory with us. So the theory, policy and practice, that fusion between. And so wherever we went, she was trying, she was showing us things that were happening um, in, in this nursery and the children were playing. And it, it made me think like she, she just really um, was very articulate about and eloquent about um, the, the way that she was, um, the, the practice that we were seeing. And, you know, in, in some ways it was quite impressive. And Marion, Adam, Wendy and I were having lots of wee discussions midway and through the tour. But the bit that really impressed me was the way that um, she, this, this head could just pull from theory to help us understand the practice. Now, um, you know, there were some times where there were some things that we saw that we might not have necessarily agreed with. It'll never leave me that the one chicken thing in the garden. Everybody knows you've got to have more than one chicken. But anyway, that's just me. And um, the other thing that um, concerned me a little and I've not um, really worked this through my my thinking yet. They had a, a visibility suite where people could um, and, and visitors could go into this visibility suite and observe the children. Now I can see two sides of that because it, the, the, the visitors weren't disturbing the play. Um, but there's another little ethical thing for me that I've never really um, aired or discussed fully with myself yet. But um, I, I just think that this, this experience those years ago kind of stimulated me to think, I really like the way that this head um, used theory to help us understand her practice. And that, that was really important. Thank you, Maria. Next slide, please. Then um, later on, we went to New Zealand um, and again, we visited loads of different settings and we, um, you know, the, the, we all kept having these conversations. So we'd be walking and talking after we were visiting them and we were saying, what is it? What if, what have they got that, that, you know, that we're kind of searching for? And um, we went to child space in New Zealand and they've got, I think at the time they had three nurseries around Wellington and well and a bit wider. And they were just about to create a forest kindergarten, which I think they've done now. But the, the great thing about this nursery or these nurseries was the, the way that they um, met um, to talk about their practice all the time. They, they developed resources. Sorry, as did Mia Mia, I forgot to say that. But Child Space also developed these uh, resources. They met, they had all these training sessions. They, they trained other people in um, what they were doing. But the thing that Eileen, Wendy, Marion and I were all really impressed with was the way that they, um, everyone was a kind of expert in a particular area. So they'd studied um, an area in the nursery and when um, our, our guide would introduce us to this person and say, oh, th this, th this person introduced clay. Well, the clay person just spouted forth this research that they'd been doing. And so we were all walking down this hill, we'd gone this big walk and then we're walking, we said, that's it, isn't it? That's what it is. They're really informed about a particular area. So in every setting, there were all these experts that had carried out a piece of research. And, um, and you know, and it really just struck home. We were all like quite excited that we'd come up with what it was that we, we couldn't understand when we'd been visiting all the other settings. And that's the thing that really impressed me. And people that know me will know that I was impressed with um, many uh, settings in New Zealand. And it, it was definitely because of that aspect. The, 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 the um, practitioners had carried out this, uh, fundamentally carried out this 
practitioner inquiry project, this research project, and therefore were really informed so that if the regulators came, they could explain exactly why they, they were doing what they were doing. And what we could see through our kind of you know, eyes of our our own lenses is that the children were undoubtedly um, really content and learning in these spaces. Now, that's something that's close to all our hearts or you wouldn't be here on a Thursday night. Um, so um, I just felt that that was a real um, big deal. Next slide, please, Marion. Then um, I, I, I traveled back, I think, um, we went a, a couple of times, a couple of years to New Zealand, but I went back myself to um, a learning stories conference and, and anybody that knows me knows that I've kind of adapted this work to lived stories. Um, and, and, you know, I was really excited and um, we all, um, Mary and Aline, Wendy and I know many of the people in this image and they were um, sharing their um, experience of these um, st this learning stories with us and, uh, you know, over time. And, and Wendy Lee invited me back and said, um, you know, I've got this conference and it'd be really nice if you could come. And I, I went back, I travelled to New Zealand and I really enjoyed the conference. It was fantastic. But what um, I left the conference feeling slightly a little bit sad. Um, and you might say, well, why then? But it was I, I really loved the way that the practitioners were would stand up in the conference and ask questions. And they were really quite confident in their practice. And and they, they all were kind of saying, oh, we've got our little bit of heaven here in New Zealand. Our practice is this. And it was really, really celebratory. Now, I'm going to say something quite sad to you, but I don't know necessarily that we hear um, Scottish uh, practitioners or or practitioners from all over the world that are working in Scotland really, really celebrating their practice in that way. Now, some of you might disagree with me and say, well, you do. Um, but I think there is something of the, the reticent Scot in us. Um, and so I came away from there thinking, I want to make a difference. This is what I want to do. I want to encourage um, our practitioners to carry out a piece of research because I genuinely believe that this makes a huge difference to our children. So it goes right back to what Eileen Wendy was saying and what Marion was saying about the real critical um, this knowledge this, and being effective and not just having this knowledge and being static, but actually growing it and and being researchers in practice. So even taking it more from um, going deeper than reflection and reflexivity to um, what um, it's Halloway talks about that diffractive way of being. So that full cycle um, is really, really important to me. Thank you. Next slide, please, Marion. So um, as uh, you know, my, my section in the uh, chapter is about practitioner inquiry, which I'm using as a kind of conceptual umbrella um, in practice. Thank you. Next slide, please. This is a quote that um, I took, and I, I think that this is really quite a, a significant one from page 136, and it's really just elaborating on that kind of dramatic change that we we really want um, for our children. We want their cho our children to come in to spaces that with their, our practitioners being really informed about what's happening. And, um, you know, and this ties very beautifully in with the, um, the national guidance, um, which is absolutely excellent. And I really do believe, and I hope I managed to convince you that um, this research that um, I, I'm suggesting that I, th I would really love to see practitioners doing and, and really loving um, doing it really deepens our thinking and and our understanding and and I'm saying here can radically and affirmatively influence transformational change in the early years. Now I say that because we've seen it. We've seen it. We went to all these nurseries in New Zealand. We um, and let's face it, we've got absolutely 
excellent sentence here in Scotland. I mean, I've been all over the world now and I still think we have the best. Um, I just want people to really believe in themselves and to articulate what, what we're doing and the way that we do it in an eloquent way. I think that's really important. Next slide, please, Marion. We, as some of you will know, um, I'm uh, the head of Cowgate Under Five Centre, as Sue said earlier, and um, we all, we always um, I, I prefer um, children to participate rather than consult, and we look at ways to ensure that they're uh, participating in uh, the life of the centre. And we're um, in the middle of a huge big project at the moment, and we were speaking to the children about um, what would they like to see researched in the centre, um, and they give us their their um, ideas about that. And um, sorry, next slide, please, uh, which is just the, the why we do research um, and the some ways that we do it. And from this, from these two um, kind of mind maps, we're uh, the children are going to study trees. So I, you know, really just building on their interests um, and and research will be carried out on that. Thank you, Marion. Next slide, please. Um, you'll know from the, the, the chapter that a member of uh, my team, Isabella Vasanova, carried out a piece of research um, with a, a wee boy, Toby, um, just really to capture his interests. And she um, followed him for two and a half hours. Um, she drew a map of the setting and then uh, followed him for two and a half hours. And um, oh my goodness, the data that that generated, it was just incredible. Um, and we did intend um, following that up with all our other children. Unfortunately, this was just before COVID, and, but I still think we're still going to do it. And we were wanting to do this with children maybe um, once, twice, three times a year. Now, um, the fabulous thing about that, and I mean, I'm, I'm absolutely certain all the practitioners on this call will think this is a fantastic thing to do. It, it helped us understand um, what Toby's interests were, what parts of the nursery he used, um, who he played with. I mean, all the stuff that is absolutely amazing when you do that kind of focused work. And also, um, you, you need your team to be supportive when you're doing it. You need to, cons you know, have these conversations with them to say, can you support me? Because I'm going to be following Toby to do this. Um, and. And, and the great thing about this this little mini piece of research, I, I mean, I think it was just fun, really phenomenal in a way, um, was then shared back with the staff. Now, everybody on this call will know right away what an insight that gives us to Toby. You know, it just gives us an immense um, insight into what he's doing, what he's playing with, who he's playing with, where, how long, what parts of the nursery. It tells us as much about what he's doing as what he's not doing. It's just a wonderful piece of work. But what I'm just trying to say is that was one small piece of research that took place, but it generated so much data and that Isabella could stand on a podium and talk about for hours at the results. Thank you, Marion. Next. Yeah, um, as many of you will know, I'm a, a, a Frobelian endorsed uh, tutor and um, my nursery is informed by uh, Frobelian principles. This little uh, poster is the latest principles from the Frobel um, Trust and you can um, uh, you know, I, I'm really sorry to say, but it, it's not as clear as it could have been, but you, you can download this um, kind of freely. And, you know, we have that framed at the beginning of our uh, nursery because it's really important to know what where your principles are emerging from. But fundamentally, I pulled out when I'm thinking about practitioner inquiry, and even if you think about that little Toby um, piece of research, this was looking at the unique child, like thinking about Toby as a unique individual. And clearly, Isabella's a very knowledgeable and nurturing educator now. And um, and she was celebrating childhood in its own right. She was celebrating um, Toby's life at this time and also the importance of him being an autonomous learner. 
Thank you. So um, this is my final slide, but really um, I hope that I've managed to share with you um, how important I feel that research is, how it helps us deepen our thinking, it enhances our knowledge, and it makes us as alive as um, the, the um, the opportunities that we want to offer for our children. And I really believe it's very uh, critical to um, what we're doing. Um, thank you very much for listening to me. And I think I'm back to Aline Wendy. Thank, thank you, Lynn and Marion. Um, and it's a bit of a responsibility to try and pull it together. What I hear running through is this question around the assumptions we make about what's going on. And I think that was very rich, Lynn, talking about um, children's participation in, in everything that's happening in the setting. And the idea of why don't we articulate in quite the same way here in Scotland as we found people did in New Zealand? We could, we're another small country, and I think we're beginning to. So I'm back to, I think it is in some ways to do with with our self-belief. And I, as I listened to Lynn just now talking about um, researching what's going on in the nursery, researching what one child is doing during a whole session, that's hugely important. But how often do we look at ourselves in that way as well? I think it's really worthwhile to self-track or to engage in a quick project, it's quite threatening, quite scary, but to engage in a quick project, for example, with how we use language with children. Do we talk to every child in the course of a session, collectively between us? Do they talk to us? Are the children who slip through that we're not sufficiently aware of, like Lynn talks about being aware of Toby? I think that can be the case. And I think it's really worthwhile to consider having an expertise in what it is we are doing and how we're conducting ourselves in a setting, as well as being uh, very observant about the children. So that really is captured in that idea of digging deep into our own practice, into our own thinking, into our own learning, and into the joys of working with children. How we join in together, how we value each other, um, across the team and across our culture. Um, somebody has put in the, um, uh, in the chat about having that connection across Scotland and maybe even having the chance to work in somebody else's setting. How brilliant would that be? So that would extend us and strengthen us in the early level. And I do mean the early level on into primary school as it, the structure is at the moment. That in turn, I hope, would raise our, the status and rewards. And I think the clock is ticking on everybody who has uh, up their qualifications, got their degrees, doing their verbal. When are you going to get together and unionize to get the pay you deserve? Because that has, hasn't yet happened in Scotland. And I would encourage you to do it, to be paid for how good you are. That also improves our status, having the rewards that you deserve so that we're making the invisible visible, we're ensuring we're heard, and apart from value, uh, valuing ourselves and each other, that we are valued publicly and collectively for what we do. And I think in lots of situations we are, but there's still a journey to go. So I think believing play is the way helps that journey. Thanks very much. Thank you, all three of you, very, very much indeed. Um, and we're back all together again. Um, right, I've got lots of questions I'd like to ask. <laughs> but if, has, has Kate got some from our audience out there? There was the one that Aileen Wendy um, commented on, somebody asking how we could share practice and, and learn from each other. Um, being in one region and wanting to see what's happening in another region and so on. Uh, have anybody any ideas? There's lots of ways how
people who are in one area can see stuff that's happening in another. I mean, the regional collaboratives are meant to be about that, are they not? And there's um, stuff. Can, can we like can we come to Marion? Yeah, Kate, you're mentioning the the RICs, you know, the regional improvement collaboratives. Um, Latterly, I was involved in the South um, West Collaborative, and so that was the kind of the Ayrshires and Dumfries and Galloway. So yes, there was a lot of sharing, a lot of collaboration, so that you didn't have people reinventing the same wheel. Uh, but also the learning that went on from that was, I think, um, really great and really heartening. And similarly, the Northern Alliance, there's a huge amount of work going on there. Uh, you know, I'm not mentioning all of the, because there are seven, <laughs> but you know, certainly we can, you know, we can cite examples, but even within the, you know, that sharing, you know, I'm thinking on the back of realizing the ambition, we have um, Educators Connect, we have other book groups going on. So there's, there's a lot there. It's how you pull it all together and make it accessible. And I guess that is the challenge. And maybe that, the, you know, the pandemic and lockdown has helped us a little bit because we've all had to become, <laughs> I'm going to use that phrase again, fleet of foot with Zoom, <laughs> know what to do with it to different platforms. So we've had opportunities to come together and share in ways that we might not otherwise. And um, puddle patters. Um, there's so many things happening. The Fribble Networks, the early years education stuff, the Fribble Trust, uh, you know, upstart stuff. There's load, too many. We'll have to make a list. Hmm? Here's a wee job for me. Um, there aren't any other questions, Sue. Well, my question then is, um, it's this it's this dichotomy. I, you said, um, I, th I think it was, was it um, Marion that said at the beginning that um, realizing the ambition had given people permission to take a child-centered um, play-based approach, principled pedagogy. And a lot of what you've been talking about is the, the business of once you do that, we empower ourselves in various ways through developing in confidence um, and then gradually increasing that confidence through, you know, sort of community of practitioners talking and a community of, of inquiry moving into the sorts of things Lynn was talking about. And I totally, totally agree with you. I hope that that will give people the confidence to speak up and, you know, say when they don't think that what's going on in perhaps their school is the right, you know, if it's going into P1 and 2 particularly, is the right approach. But we also do need other people to value early years. And I am not, I, I was not initially an early years person. I'm, I'm only really been here for the last, say, 15 years, really. But it really annoys me how little account the higher echelons of the education system take of early years, given how much we know of its importance. Um, so while I, I totally agree with everything you're saying, what can we do also to try and make sure that apart from anything else, they, they, get, they put early years people on committees that are discussing education. So often there's nobody with an early year special, specialism. How do we try and, and, and insist that they take early years as seriously as it absolutely needs to be taken? I think sometimes we have to ask people the question that we would like to be asked ourselves. I remember considering the transition to secondary school and um, I was working on the transition to primary, but a head teacher was saying to me, but you no, know, they they just all come in, we, we, we get them registered and that's it. And I said, how do you feel when your primary sevens go on to secondary? And there was this terrible pause and I thought, oh dear, I'm in trouble. And then she very graciously said, you're absolutely right. I don't look at the early transition in the way that I look at my little ones going on into secondary school. And I think there's a flip. It's, I, I said at a CIRA conference before now, there's no point any of you being here if you don't pay attention to the early years. 
we have to be brave and to say, but uh, since I've, I've got the, the Zoom for the second, there was somebody who said, what do we do? I think we need to consider how that, that freedom for children to explore and engage, learn and play in nursery is something we can learn deeply from, but also reflect on what happens to that autonomy when the child enters so many primary schools. And I think that's um, a, a really important point um, for us to reflect upon because we've said for many years we're not a, in early childhood in the business of preparing children from school for school and yet the whole of early childhood is a preparation for what comes next it sets children up so how do we deal with that with and how do we work together with colleagues in both sectors there's a huge play movement going on in primary early primary at the moment um, it's people are doing everything they can in so many situations they there is a great love of re realizing the ambition but so often people are, it's one person with a larger number of children than we ever have in the nursery sector on our own and i think there's something about that strength and autonomy that children bring into school, that it would be wonderful if primary colleagues would recognize that they have a team of 26 in the room and they don't actually have to manage everybody all of the time. The children can actually do so much to help and support each other and to work together. So that would be a conversation, I think, um, for thinking about what happens next and, and Aileen I think that's exactly right if you listen to people like Leanne Sweeten um you know yeah. that's what she yeah. says you know they're teaching each other and that's what happens isn't it? it happens in a nursery and it happens further up and it's when teachers recognize that they've got that those skills from the children and the children get so much from it supporting each other don't they yeah, that was Zoe's question that Aileen mentioned. Um, um, Siobhan McLeod's got a question about pay. She might want to come on and ask it. Siobhan? It was, it was just um, earlier on with the discussion about, like, um, you know, banding together and, you know, when are we going to ask to kind of be paid, basically, you know, better and stuff like that. And, as as a struggle that's ongoing, as a struggle like we all know to be recognised, you know, um, over twenty years ago there was that movement in Scotland where, you know, everybody went out, everybody said no, we want more recognition, we want better pay, because everybody then, you know, settled individually. We all have different titles, we all have different pay grades, um, with an authority level certainly anyway, you know private sectors are paid poorly again, um, you know, and, and it is kind of like, you know, even currently, currently there is still a fight about equal pay. And actually we've just been told that, you know, the um, certain authorities are deciding that actually, you know, we might just now decide to remove child development officers from that equal pay. When we were initially part of it, now we're being told, mm, actually, we might just take you out of it. So again, it's like, you know, I know it's not all about pay because for us it is about what we do, but, you know, it comes hand in hand about kind of getting people into the job. So what do you do? We, we are kind of still going, but is it down to the fact that we're under the social care umbrella, you know, and does education take us less seriously? It's it is a hard one. It's how do we how do we, you know, how do we have this conversation with other people that are in education and have them listen? Would there be anything in a professional association of early educators for Scotland? I've wondered sometimes. I I, I mentioned unions and that was really stirring it, but I, I think um, I think. Unison particularly is so huge and has so many different um, types of employees that it tries to represent. And I think it's really hard to get cohesion there for, for early years. I think in some way there's, 
that there's a real growing professionalism in, in its absolutely best about what professionalism is about early childhood. And I think that's the thing to grapple with. And through that, if, if we could have a, a coherence together about what it is to be a professional, an effective professional and practitioner in early childhood, then that's the voice that would come across very strongly um, about being recognized for that and being rewarded effectively. And I think the argument about um, different types of practitioner being paid differently, like, you know, um, early years graduates aren't paid the same as teachers. I don't think they're helpful because they're not doing, you know, the similarities and differences in what they do. I think it's much more to get a, a mutual voice about what matters for families and for young children and from that to step off I mean it, it, it's too vague I know it's too altruistic but um, maybe it would be a starting point and we do have all these meetings together that people have. Somebody's talking about all the different job titles and how it's very confusing for the public and maybe we just need one job title for the early level. I like pedagogue <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that was me that put that message on. Who's that? Sarah. Um, my name's Sarah. Oh, Sarah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I've worked in a few different authorities and had a different job title in every single one. Um, <laughs> but the bottom line is when I renew my car insurance, I'm still a nursery nurse. Because there's nothing else equivalent. Uh, so it's not seen as a profession because it's something different everywhere. I think even the fact that in some places we're practitioners, some places we're officers, some places we're educators. And I do believe, and I think there are still um, some authorities where we're called nursery nurses. So that confusion's there for everyone when we try and explain what we do for a living. And I think if we had a common job title, then, you know, a teacher's a teacher wherever, a policeman's a policeman wherever. I do think it's something that's missing in this profession. I that think there was decide. an attempt in, in England at one point to, to use the term early years practitioner for um, as a, as a catch-all term, but it, it never took on, particularly since it was including reception, um, you know, equivalent of P1, because it's part of the foundation stage. It's a divide and separate thing, isn't it? Um, which is what employers very often like to use to ensure that they keep paid out. Well, absolutely. And actually the authority that I work in now, there's four or five different job titles for the same, almost the same role, um, obviously. But by putting four or five different job titles and we can have four or five different pay grades. And especially if, as, as was mentioned, we are talking about the whole of early level, we really do need what Ali and Wendy, I think, referred to in the chapter as a, a blended profession, where it, it really doesn't matter what the qualification is, what you're bringing is your expertise, your understanding and your professionalism to it. I love your idea of a professional association of early years educators in the chat box that Mary Maloney is researching that in Ireland. Did, who was that? Hold on a minute, sorry. Alison Moore from oh, Cork. Yeah. Thank you, Alison. Uh, yeah, just early days, but yeah, she's um, she started the conversation and research about professionalism and creating a body to advocate for, for our sector. And oh my goodness, we'd love to be that. kept in, in touch with that. Hmm. I think it is that. I don't, I don't think it's the registration bodies or the um, people who pay you. I think it's something different. And I do worry with making the suggestion because we have lots of different bodies already. Do we need another? But maybe if it's something that, that um, collectively is owned by early years practitioners, that they're bringing it together, that that, that would be a beginning and I, I think it'll take time it'll probably take you 20 years but if we don't make a start now where will the profession be in 20 years time 
I'll probably be in a care home, but... <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then, then there was a question about your lived stories as well. Everybody wants to know more about them, but I think somebody said on the thing that you'd done a presentation about it recently. I think I heard one recently. Your lived yeah, stories. I, I mean, the, the great thing about, I mean, I, as we all spend lots of time um, observing our children, the 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 bit that I, we kind of disagreed with was um, developmental milestone tick charts that were um, being offered to use, and we just felt that never saw, uh, you know, the the, the child themselves, and um, so we we carried out a little piece of research that. Um, we looked at the, the learning stories from New Zealand and really loved them. However, um, we didn't, because Wendy Lee and, and co talk about every moment's a learning moment. But what we discovered was that not every moment is a learning moment. Um, there was a child that was upset behind um, a member of staff, Leanne Higgins, um, and this child doesn't wasn't a child that would have normally uh, got upset and Leanne stopped what she was doing, went to the child. And it turns out the child was worried about something that was happening at home. And um, truly enough, the mother had had a cancer scare. And so although the mum thought that she was preventing um, maybe trying to protect her child, the child was obviously picking up what was happening, that something wasn't right at home. And so we were thinking that as a, a team that, that those kind of experiences are really critical as well to capture. And so we changed the title from learning stories to lived stories so that it captured the kind of civic life of the child as well as the learning moments. And basically, um, the, 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 the lived story is a, a, a narrative, like a narrative like we would always do. And then um, there's a bit analysis, a professional analysis. And, you know, that that does a lot more than just uh, provides analysis on it. You know, you're sharing this with parents and families and they can you can they can get a real sense of what the child is learning. Um, through this analysis. So obviously if it's the block play, you know, somebody might be writing about the mathematical benefits or spatial awareness or, you know, there's so many benefits that the um, the author of this lived story will be writing. And then, um, and this is really important when we think about it from a Frobelian perspective, possible provocations, not next steps, um, but possible provocations, because that child might be, as we all know here, that child might be finished what with what they've done. They've done. You know that might be they, they've had an experience. Um, however, it's it's this possible provocation from the experienced uh, author of this observation. And also, it's really, really important that um, children are also invited um, to contribute to these um, little observations. And I mean, they, they're, they're quite lengthy. Um, so we don't, um, they, they take, we, we give um, staff time out of the room to write them up. Um, so they get an hour and a half each week to write um, one of these stories up. Um, and, you know, I really, really value them and really believe in them because I absolutely believe they capture um, the the individuality of that particular child. And the child is not seen as part of a homogenous um, group. Um, so thank, thank you. you, whoever asked about them. Um, I, I'm very passionate about them, so thanks. We're, we're coming towards the end, Kate. Is there any other question very quickly? No, everybody's just... Same then time. can I can I just make uh, when, just listening to Lynn then I was thinking I spent today putting up a blog on the Upstart website which is very much a lived story of um, and someone working in early years first in primary schools and then in nurseries um, and it's a, a very very insightful blog um, about, it called fighting the system. And I do recommend it to anyone if it's on our website now, if if you've not spotted it yet. Um, I'm it, it, so it, grateful. It, it, Sorry? Sorry, it is in England. 
It, well, yes, it's a it's an English practitioner, but she is talking about how she's now looking to Scotland to sort it all out. <laughs> so I think we, <laughs> I think there's a lot about it though that would resonate with Scottish educators. Um, anyway, I, it, I found it a fascinating discussion. I, um, I, I, so many interesting ideas, and I hope we can maybe take some of them forward um, or help people to take them forward. Um, I've got to thank you so much, all three of you. Thank you very, very much indeed for your chapter and then for your being here today and for everything that you're doing to, um, you know, enhance early years. We've all got to carry on making sure that we raise its status with everyone because it's the most important bit of the educational system, possibly of society as a whole, or maybe even of the entire species. Um, uh, thank you, everybody. Um, it's officially our, our last um, book group because we've covered the whole of Play is the Way now, but Kate has ideas for more stuff. So I've still got to talk to you about what they are, but I hope we'll be visit meeting again sometime in the near future. Thank you very, very much, everybody that's been involved. Good night. Goodbye.